All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for Tuesdays with CQLS, Cataloging Tips and Tricks. I have a few reminders for upcoming events. Um, we have the Summer Library Program in November. That will be in person, and that is on November 10th. It will be um, Summer Library Program for 2022, because I know you guys are so excited now that you're almost done with 2021 to get to the next one. Um, August 4th is our final uh, online trustee training for, for this summer. It'll be um, 10 ways your library board can sabotage the library or 10 things not to do, whichever way you prefer to say that. And that will be at 6.30 on August 4th online. And then on August 8th, 18th here in Great Bend, we will have the Technology Day. It is an all day event. Um, from 9 to 3.30, there will be three sessions going on at the same time, so you get to kind of pick which one you want to go to. All the handouts from all the sessions will be available to everybody that attends. Excuse me, I am going to turn that off. Um, so look for that. Uh, it will be here in Great Bend. Lunch will be on your own, but we will have uh, a breakfast snack and then a take-home snack as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to introduce you Elizabeth Duclo. She is our catalog extraordinaire, and uh, she's going to go through some cataloging tips and tricks for us today. Hi, everybody. I hope you had a good lunch if you've had one already. Um, yeah, when Mary Beth asked me if um, I would be willing or the group asked me if I'd be willing to do this. I was like, sure. And then it happened as like, no, <laughs> <laughs> but it'll be okay. Um, so cataloging is very important to me, not just because it's my job, but because I do like the detailed work and like the detective work um, that cataloging takes, um, like really good cataloging takes. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And there's going to be I want to warn you, I am going to be scrolling and I'm going to be moving between a lot of different screens because I'm not going to show you how to catalog. I'm going to give you a lot of resources. Okay. Um, if you want training on cataloging, give me a call, hit me up after this, email me, and we can arrange a time to go over it on Log Me In or I can come out or something like that. Okay. All right. So I believe, yep. Are you seeing the cataloging tips and tricks uh, infographic? Yes. Yes. Um, awesome. yes. Okay. Yeah. So I have um, an interesting personality. And so I am kind of your Willy Wonka for today. And I will be helping you explore the world, the magical world of cataloging. And we're going to start by going through some of the history. And I'm going to go ahead and scroll down a little bit. So close your eyes if you get nauseous. And so this is kind of an interesting timeline. We have, we start cataloging pretty much starts back in, that we have record of in 2000 BCE. So before common era, before Christ. And it started with cuneiform, which is this wonderful picture done here. And it's just, it was a wooden square block that they pressed into wet clay and they let dry. And they've actually found um, these clay tappets with records of um, for storage and things like that, um, warehouses. But it evolved since then. We invented, invented the print, uh, printing press and Dewey Decimal came in and Cutter came in and they kind of established a good way of record keeping for libraries. And in 1970, uh, around there, the Library of Congress went ahead and adopted the MARC format or the machine readable catalog. And that was kind of the first step into the digital age because machine readable catalog means that it can be read, read by machines. Um, in 2006, this wonderful big circle here, Tim, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who if you don't know, invented the internet, like truly invented the internet. He in introduced the concept of linked data or um, a, basically a how-to guide for linked data because when he invented the internet, he wanted to incorporate that from the very beginning. And I will get to what linked data is in just a moment. And in 2013, the Library of Congress went ahead and adopted and started moving towards 
adding linked data and bridging the barriers that prevented library catalogs from communicating with other systems and kind of making sure that everything got automated. Um, so other systems also means search engines like Google. So, and I think by 2014, all of CKLS's public yeah. libraries have became automated, right? Okay, that's just, I came like after that, so I'm like very spoiled. <laughs> I didn't have to go through that automation process, which kudos to everyone who did. I don't know how you did it, probably a lot of willpower and groaning, but um, like awesome job for doing that. And 2020 and 2021, excuse me, um, we the system as a whole started moving closer to linked data by incorporating a discovery system for our OPAC side called Aspen Discovery. Um, you may have seen it. Um, it basically helps bring all the formatted uh, formats of an item together. So you have like your books, your audio books, um, and streaming services or anything like Sunflower eLibrary. Those all go under one record. And we'll take a look at that in a little bit. So we all know that libraries are really good about providing access to information. That's kind of what we do. And the, our way of doing that has changed drastically since 2000 BCE with Cuneiform. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see the change from MARC records to uh, and your actual card catalog to your automated catalog. And now we have this kind of amorphous linked data um, that not a lot of people really know about, but it's been getting integrated in because this is more of a subtle change to the cataloging field rather than an abrupt change that the automation was. Um, so, and it can be kind of intimidating because you start talking about linked data and like making URIs and XML coding. And you're just like, wait a minute, I don't even know HTML or anything like that. I can open up my browser maybe. Um, that's, and that's the, the world for some people, but what linked data actually does and like the core of what it is, is it um, connects a creator to a piece of work and that work to other pieces of work by that creator or other items that are that have the same subject and it also connects authors that write in a similar style to other authors and so so on uh, and so by integrating linked data fields into our catalog we are um, opening up our catalogs not only to um, our patrons but we're opening it up to those large search engines like google um, so eventually we hope that linked data slash mark record hybrids will open up the entire catalog to the World Wide Web. So whatever search engine someone uses, if they're looking for a specific book that's at your library and they're near your library, it'll pop up on that first results page. Because a lot of times people don't go past that first results page no matter what search browser they're using. And to do that, and to get us to that point, we need to adhere to some industry standards. I am very big on standards. I used to weld. Like if I didn't follow standards, I wouldn't have kept my job. <laughs> that is one of those things that uh, I'm a stickler for. And you, some of you may have gotten an email from me saying like, hey, could you take a look at this? And it's all, in all honesty, it's just wanting to make sure that our record is the best that it can be because if you've seen some of the records, you know that there's some things missing occasionally. So going back to our standards, um, there are many different sets of standards that we employ in the library world. I'm gonna scroll a little bit more. Um, and that way, everything, when we use standards, everything's created the same way and presented in the same format. So it makes it easier for librarians and patrons to find, identify, obtain, create, or discover items or information. Um, because we f follow these industry set standards, we need to keep an eye on the records we make, what we bring in, what we attach our items to, and so on. So if you've ever grabbed, like, have you ever grabbed like something from Walmart that you had to put together yourself or Ikea? 
um, it's you usually follow those instructions. That's basically a set of standards that you follow to get a final project. If you don't, and looking at this, sometimes you end up with something that you don't necessarily want or is useful at all. So we go ahead and follow those standards to make sure that we get the right product. Okay, so, and again, many of you remember moving over from our card catalog to our automated system. Um, what is different with the link data? Cause this, this is kind of this record that we're seeing is something that we see a lot. Um, what RDA standards add are this content type, media type, carrier type, these bolded items here. Liz, along... can you make that a little bigger? Yes, I can. Thank you. And I'm gonna scroll down, so does that work? Yes. Okay, good. So you have this content type, and I can't really change my mouse, sorry guys. Uh, <laughs> media type and carrier type. So those are your three XX fields. Um, your another part of RDA that we add in are con, uh, controlled vocabulary or subject headings. And these are your six, six XX fields. So these are um, subjects are your 650 fields. And occasionally you'll have something like um, a person's name and that's your 600 field and a place would be like this Massachusetts would be 651. We'll get more into that later. <laughs> but um, these are some of the standards that we are adding to records to make sure that you can search for them faster and that you can connect these items to other items. So say you want a romance book in Massachusetts for some reason. Um, so you can look up Massachusetts romance um, and that will go ahead and bring up like items or items with these tags or controlled vocabulary in them. They're not tags. Tagging is informal for like social media. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I see that some of your topics are separated by a backslash and some are separated by a mm -hmm. double hyphen. Is one RDA and one mark or is that just preference or what is the difference there? So there are different types of 650 um, controlled headings. There are, there isn't just one list um, that we get our controlled vocabulary for. What we use mainly is the Library of Congress controlled vocabulary. And I'll get more on that in a second. But there are other controlled vocabularies that they use that appear in our records. So by default, we use those as well. Um, what this denotes is actually a different field. And I will show you that um, when we look closer at a record. OK. So if we scroll, I'm going to scroll down just a little bit. I'm going to further explain controlled vocabularies and authorities. And I'm going to minimize this page again just a little bit. Can you guys see that OK? Okay. Yes, we can see the whole chart. Good. So by looking at the circle graph, you can see how like this purple cooking has different terms surrounding it. So you have reheating, cookery, food preparation, culinary, and mincing. Um, all of these items are different parts of cooking. And in the Library of Congress catalog, uh, controlled heading, subject headings, they are all fall under, excuse me, cooking. So no matter if you put in these words, what will come up is cooking. That is the controlled term for all of those words, okay? So if you were to type in um, feline instead of cats when you're searching, it would bring up things about cats. Or if you're trying to find kittens or anything like that, it would default to cats if you're trying to put that subject heading into your uh, record, okay? And that's when you're searching the Library of Congress website, which we are going to go to now. So this is the Library of Congress subject headings. This link and all these tabs that I go to are in the handouts. 
this is where you can search for subject heading terms to put in your 650 fields. Okay, you can use this drop down box right here. And you can go to name authority files, which are finding authors names. And you can do uh, children's subject headings as well, as well as genre or form. And those are just the ones I'm going to go over. There's a long list. If you want to explore it later at your leisure, please go ahead and do that. Okay. Next, I'm going to scoot over to our cheat sheet for RDA. And this is, these are the 300 fields that you can use when you're, um, if some people are wanting to, uh, when people are wanting to original catalog and they need to add these in. Um, these are the fields that you need to add in are these 336, 337, 338. They can multiply, uh, you can have more than one on each of uh, on the 336 and 337s and 338s uh, if you have multiple items in the record, so like a kit. But again, I'll go over more of that in just a little bit. So we're going to go over back to my presentation. I'm going to scroll down. And so beginners, hey. You guys are wonderful. You're so bright eyed, bushy tailed, shiny eyes. You have no idea what you're in for. It's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> so basic, basic beginning for a beginner. When you're looking for a record, you're gonna, if you're on Koha or whatever system you use, you wanna do an ISBN or SN search. An ISBN is the um, barcode on the back of your book. An SN number is the barcode on the back of a DVD or Blu-ray, okay? So they're pretty much the same thing. They're an identifier for whoever made that item. Then if you can't find it that way, you're gonna do a title and author search, okay? Those are the first two things that you need to do before you even think about pulling in a record. If you can't find it, you can send in a record request to me or you can go ahead and do a Z39 search. And I'm going to go here. So when you're doing a Z39 search for our beginners, what I use, I use these settings right here. This is good enough for me. I always use the standard ID here at the bottom. The reason why is that when I'm doing DVDs, audiobooks, playaways, anything, um, not playaways so much anymore because they discontinued that, but books, I use this because it'll bring up anything that that ISBN, it brings up anything that is scanned into there with a, a identifier number. So your SN and ISBN both work in that. It's a quick way. It's one place that you go to every single time. Um, you don't have to switch between the top and the bottom. The next thing I do, yes. What is an ASIN number? An ASIN number is an Amazon oh, identifier. identifier. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and you can submit those to me. I will kind of, I, I will try to find, do my best to find it, but they reuse those and they delete those. So if they have sold out of something, they will delete that or they'll reuse it for something else. So yeah, it can be tricky, especially with <laughs> self-publishing and they don't put an ISB on it, B on it, ISBN on it until they, they print it and send it out to you. So they'll have the ASIN number. But if that author pulls the book, then that ASIN number doesn't really work anymore. Sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> the, comment is, the comment is while you're finding your place. I know why my Amazon cheating fails me, LOL. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, that is, that is a thing. Okay. Okay, there we are. So we scanned in our standard ID number. Very first thing I'm going to look at, if I have a book in my hand, I'm going to know the pages of that book before I look at anything else. I scanned in the ISBN. I know that's correct. So I will look over here at this additional fields first. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that matches. Um, the page numbers match and the length match. That's the first thing I look at. 
Then I come over to the other side, the res uh, on the server, I usually pick OCLC. The reason why I pick OCLC is because they use Library of Congress records. It used to not, the records used to not be very good. I will be the first one to admit that. Um, now they are phenomenal. They have an entire team dedicated to uh, revamping their records, updating their subject headings, and adding in all the RDA and all the um, other international standards that they need onto these records. So they are top notch in my book. I'm also a little biased because I use OCLC Classified to do my uh, my cataloging, and I will I will show you that at the end if we have time. Um, so this is the fastest way to find a book. Um, your DVDs, the run times may vary. If it says a minute off and it's the same everything else, you can pull it in and put approximate by it. But let me get back on track. I keep getting <laughs> off on it. I get off, got off on a tangent. Okay, so. Then you'll check these RDA fields. So you, you've checked your pages, you checked your OCLC. Um, you're more than welcome to use something else if you find a good record. That's just the one I prefer. Um, the addition's correct, everything's correct. And I've checked these and these match my um, RDA cheat sheet that I want for a book item. What I am going to do next is I'm gonna click on it. I'm gonna do a mark preview. I know a lot of people prefer the card preview. It does not give you all the information. And this is a little bit harder to look at. I'm gonna see if I can, oh, nope, that does not do it. Um, can you make you the window bigger maybe? And then zoom in? I don't know if I can. Okay. Maybe here, let's, let's, I think it stays the same, honestly. Yeah, oh, shoot. unfortunately, okay. I'm sorry guys. <laughs> It um, stays the same because it's a pop-up window. That's there why. There we go. Good to know. I didn't know that. Um, so what you will check for, for beginners, you're going to go ahead and check your title, author. Obviously, that was all on that first page. From here on out, you're going to look for your um, summary, which is your 520. Then you're going to look for your 650 fields. These are your subject headings that I love so much. And you want at least five to 20 of them. I know 20 is a lot. If you don't find, that's fine. At least five. That gives a good starting point for the catalog to start bouncing off of each other. Okay. Then if it's a children's book, you want the illustrator and the 700 fields. Okay they are a contributing, they get a credit for that book because a lot of the times author, children's authors and children's illustrators don't even meet. They each have a contract, they each do a credit for the book and you know how important pictures are in children's books, especially, you know, picture books and board books. Um, for DVDs in the same field, you'll just kind of do your runtime. Like I said, the size, for DVDs is usually 12 centimeters or four and three quarters, uh, four and three quarters inches. I don't know why they bounce back and forth between that. Usually everything's supposed to be in centimeters, but they do that. Also with RDA, it's what you see is what you get. So when you are looking for a book, you're going to find all the information off of the title page and the title verso, not the cover of the book. And that's because that is what the catalogger uses, at least Library of Congress catalogers and what I use, um, because it is the standard. Uh, that's what we use to go off to create the record. Sometimes when you're looking at the title verso page for a nonfiction, it's really great because they will give you subject headings and they will also give you the Dewey number so you don't have to search for those. That is a blessing. Um, but again, look at the age of the book because subject controlled headings they get updated. And so anything older than five years, you kind of want to double check and maybe not use those. And if it's five years old and it's not in the catalog already, you may want to try another search. Okay, I'm going to, Does... I'm going to like stop sharing 
and I'm going to just kind of show you the title verso page. So your title page is your interior title. That's this. Your title verso is the page behind it. Now, I will warn you, there are a lot of self-publishers out there and they will not have any of this information on there. So um, you'll be lucky if you get a place of publishing and um, a note saying that it's copyrighted and things like that. But for books that are published under a publisher, it will have a lot of really good information for you. When we measure books, we measure along the length of the spine, okay? Not if it's a out of shape board book or wonky shape, you still just measure the spine. Um, some people will measure the entire length, that's okay, but generally we just measure along the spine. For your DVDs, where you'll usually find information, where you should pull the title from is from the disc, not from the back uh, or not from the front of the cover or anything like that. You want to pull it from the disc. Um, you also want to try to see if the runtime's on there. A lot of the times it is. Very tiny script along the rim. I would suggest if you're doing a lot of DVDs to invest in a mic uh, uh, magnifying glass. There we go. Right word. Um, you don't need a microscope. Sometimes. Um, and you will also uh, get into a lot of the specifics on the back. I wish everyone published them this clearly. They don't. They're usually right around this bottom edge or up in the middle. Um, but those are good spots to look for it. For books on publishers, the spine right here is a good place to look. Title page underneath the author. It'll also tell you the city. Sometimes if you're lucky, it'll tell you the date um, that it was copyrighted or published. Audiobooks are a different beast, okay? A lot of times they will round off to the nearest quarter, half, or full hour. They will not give you the proper runtime. They will not say this was seven hours and 28 minutes. They will say this is seven and a half hours. Usually you'll see uh, an approximately by those um, times and it's okay to add your um, item to that record if it's off by just a little bit. If it's off by like an hour or two, you probably need have a different version. Um, so that's just kind of a warning flag. Again, like the DVDs, you're gonna pull your information off the face of the disc. Liz? Yes. Um, do, when you put the runtime for um, DVDs or for audiobooks, mm -hmm. do you use um, hour, minute, or do you make it all in minute? Because I've so, seen some both ways. I have seen them both ways, and I have not seen any concrete um, data on which is preferred. I think it's falling back on the whole RDA what you see is what you get. If it is published in hours and minutes on the item, then do hours and minutes on the record. Okay. Okay. That's just a good rule of thumb. Thank you. Okay. And for children's books, I love children's books. If you couldn't tell, <laughs> I like I like children's books. Um, their title verso is usually in the back of the book, but for some odd reason, and and like most of them have it in the back of the book because it's easier. Some of them will have it in the front. Some of it will have it printed really tiny and like little pictures and stuff. Board books, it's usually on the back of the book. And um, there won't be as much information on the board books. But again, you work with it what you can. Okay, let me see if I can find my place. Okay, we're going to go ahead and say, once you've gone through all of that and you've done your search and you still can't find the item. Do you want to for, share your screen again? I will in one second. Okay. Um, what you're going to do is your, I'm going to get rid of this because I don't need it anymore. What you're going to do, and <laughs> I did a good job. I minimized my Word document. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. So what we're going to do is you can, oh, record request form. You can send it into me or 
we have this wonderful, not what I wanted, also not what I wanted. Okay, I have on our CKLS page under forms and reports, and the link to this page exactly is in the handout. We have this wonderful section for cataloging, and this is where you can request. This is where this replaced the pink slips. If you were here long enough, um, you were able to send in pink slips with like the ISBN title, things like that on it in, and we would get the records to you. This is a digital version of that, okay? I have a few more fields added onto it because I, I, I this isn't the information I need if I'm making a record from scratch. And it's if, uh, if I can cut down on the amount of time I have to search for it, I can get more stuff done. Um, but we have books, TVs, movies, magazines, board games, which also include puzzles. Um, and you can do cake pans in there. I sure really will look at changing that name later. Audiobooks, you can request spine labels and you can report records that you find that are just kind of wonky, okay? So you're like, I don't think that needs to be there. Pop in here, just put in your name, the record number or uh, an identifier to get to that and we can take a look at it. We're also looking at adding in a Dewey Decimal Request Number form. And I'm going to try to have that out this week. Okay, we're going to switch back to my presentation. And so this is just kind of, this is still beginners, but this is what you're, what I just kind of went over um, for what you want to look at when you're bringing in a record. Okay, for intermediate catalogers, hey guys, you know what you're getting into now. <laughs> So you um, have a good handle on it. You've been bringing in records for a bit. Good, 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 uh, good rule of thumb now is that you could start editing those records that you're bringing in, okay? So what you're gonna do is if you find a record that you really like, but the page numbers are off or the size is off or it's maybe, it has some misspellings or it has like 20 ISBNs and you only need two, you can go ahead and go in and edit those details, okay? Don't change the whole record, but if it's just a couple of things, that's when you wanna go in and edit. And I'm going to show you how you can delete and add fields in Koha, okay? So I'm gonna to switch to cataloging. Nope, I need to continue down the line. My apologies. See, here we are. So we have this wonderful book. And if you can well, enlarge that a little bit, that would be helpful. Does that work, everybody? That's better. Okay. Do we need to do one more? Maybe one more. There we go. That's okay. Good, Thank good, you. good. We will get into these later. But when you come down, and did you see these wonderful things at the top? I have to, I have to praise these for a bit. Um, Michael added these on a little bit ago, um, and they are going to be very helpful for our beginner and intermediate catalogers because you're not trying to remember which page you're supposed to be going to. It's right there for you. Um, but for adding or deleting um, fields, of course you can highlight and delete, but say. Um, you're adding in your book because it matches that record exactly. It's just missing the ISBN. What you're gonna do is you're gonna find a new field you like. And right here, you're going to hit repeat this tag. And you just click it and it brings in that same tag. If you're like, oh, I made a mistake. Right here, this X, just delete this tag. Very simple um, way to go ahead and add fields and delete them. And you can do that anywhere you see these two things. So next one are these question marks. I don't know how many of you have explored these, but these are your best friend when you are starting to learn about original cataloging or if you are um, just wanting to add something in. If you have a question about this field, because oh, what is an international standard book number? You click on that question mark and it brings you to Mark 21, what this is and how you should enter items in, okay? 
this is a wonderful little guide for you. Um, it shows like what fields you can enter in, things like that. Canceled fields are fields that you don't really need to mess with at this point in time, but Zs are basically unread. What you're always gonna do, oop, wrong page, wrong page. There we go. Um, Z fields are basically ignored uh, for the O2Os and O2Fours. Your A field is where you want to put in all of your um, adding in your A field is where you're gonna put your main branch of information, okay? Another great uh, item that I have for intermediate individuals is OCLC classify. This is when your record is missing a Dewey decimal number and you need it right away. You can go to OCLC classify I love this thing. I discovered it when I was cataloging in Great Bend. And you can put in your standard number or the ISBN or SN number, and it will bring up, hopefully, that item. If it is an OCLC already, it should give you the most frequently used Dewey Decimal classification number. It will also give you the Library of Congress classification number. So watch out if it has letters before it, OK? <laughs> But you can also, if you don't have, if you can't find it here, you can also look up the main subject that that book is about, okay? If you put in turtles, it will bring up turtles. You can even pick Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh my gosh, things like that. Click on Sea Turtles, find a book that looks kind of what you're doing. Nims Island looks pretty good. That's close to what I want. Tells you the most frequent number that's used, okay? So OCLC Classify is a wonderful resource. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to go kind of deeper into the RDA cheat sheet. So if your record is missing parts, this is where you would go, especially if it's missing that RDA component. This is where you can go for a quick, what can I grab from here? So if you've got your books, these are the items that you'll use for your books for those fields. Um, if it's missing subject headings, these down here are some quick ads that I put together for different genres, okay? So if you've got a romance book, romance fiction in A, in V you'll put fiction. If it is a nonfiction item, then you will ignore the V and it will automatically it's just assume that it's a nonfiction item, okay? The fiction- I do have a question. I see you have romance fiction in A and then V says fiction again. So mm -hmm. it reads as romance fiction fiction. It does. That's a little bit of a double cover. You can still have it. It just reads romance fiction fiction. Okay. And then I see um, on the third one, the man woman relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, fiction isn't capitalized in V. Is is it is that a typo? I don't mean to out you. Or is that no? Is that supposed to be that way? And why? Okay. So when I catalog on OCLC, it fixes all that stuff for me. So this is a typo. Oh, okay. I thought maybe there <laughs> okay. was a reason. There's, there's not a reason. Catalog or reason. Unfortunately, no, that comes with the punctuation, which is much more confusing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I have romance. I have mystery of Western because those tend to be like the main ones. Um, and I even have young adult LGBT because that's coming in more and this gives a good example of what you're going to use for geographic locations. And then also genre. So this tells everybody the genre of the item. Um, put these in and it will automatically put that in the genre section. And so it will sort things by genre that way. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Can you use um, the genre? Can you use that for more than one so yes. maybe it's suspense and fantasy yes so you'd have a 655 a science fiction and then a 655 a suspense mm -hmm. fiction so there'd be and, two okay. yeah so these 650s 6050 any of these they're repeatable use them if you have a fan science fiction fantasy there's elves on spaceships use them both repeat those fields okay <laughs> if it's a historical fiction you can put that in i should probably add that um, 
I can update this as we go. This is just kind of a um, quick buzz on original cataloging. So I have a question. Why do some records have the exact same subject or genre multiple times in the same record? Is that just because it's been used over and over again or is there a cataloging super secret reason? Not a cataloging super secret reason. Um, your 650 will show it and your 655 and those are just two different fields that get searched. Does that make sense? So so like if you have 651 as your subject and you have it romance fiction, fiction, and then when you do your genre, you would do your 655 and you mm -hmm. mark it as romance fiction there. And then it would be yep. duplicated. And on your record, when you're looking at it just in the catalog, it would look like it was repeated. Yes. That, okay. That is correct. Okay. So we did kind of get into the advanced territory. So I'm going to go back to my Prezi presentation and I'm kind of going to go over um, when in doubt, again, send me an email, give me a call. I'll, I'll try to help you out. <laughs> if, you, if you're really in doubt, you can just send it in. <laughs> it's okay. You're not admitting defeat. You're just getting a little bit of help. It's okay. Okay, so advanced. You guys know what you've gotten into, like completely. You understand. At this point, again, you know what you're doing, you understand quite a bit about cataloging and record keeping. And some days it does feel like this, like honestly. Oh, it does. I do have another question. I do yes. have another question. Does it help to have both 650 and 655 in the record? Duplication seems like a waste of time. It does seem like a waste of time, but they are two different fields. So your 650 is controlling the vocabulary for subjects. So like if you did like a keyword search mm -hmm. or you did a subject search of romance fiction, mm -hmm. it's going to search one thing. But if you do a genre, mm -hmm. um, especially in Aspen Discovery, where yeah. you can do like a, a search group and say we want all the genre of science fiction, it's going to look in the 655s. So that's yeah. why you need it in both because the computer, when it's looking for subjects, is going to look in one place and when it's looking for genres it looks in another place. Yeah, and as we go on with records and how they evolve, we are pandering more and more to the digital interface because they're the ones that are doing a lot of the, the digital, computers are the ones doing a lot of the work. Um, they're doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, they're finding items for you um, because you're just typing in a quick search. It's, they need specific things um, to do their job. And so if you are trying to search one way and you don't have that tagged appropriately, you're not gonna find as near as much. This is the part where by adhering to some of these standards, you're helping the search go faster. You're finding things faster. You're able to um, get them out to your patron faster. One of, the, one of the goals for cataloging is to make your things findable. Mm -hmm. And we all know that Liz and I think differently. And I think everybody on here thinks a little bit differently than anybody else. So one of the goals, and I don't know if it's actually a futile goal or not, but one of the goals for cataloging is trying to um, well, catalog everything in a way that's no matter where you come at the record looking for it, it will be picked up and found. And that means that sometimes you have to catalog one thing many different ways. So that's the repeatable subject field and genre field and, mm -hmm. and those kind of things. And, and these things are getting updated at some point, maybe they will connect those two fields and one of them will become obsolete. I mean, I can't, that sounds like a logical thing to do. I don't know <laughs> if they're gonna do it, <laughs> but for now, that's how we're doing it. Okay, if you're getting uh, tired of watching Kirk get smothered in trouble, scroll, <laughs> scroll down just a little bit. Okay, for my advanced, wonderful, wonderful advanced people, we're going to go and talk a little bit more about these um, double O sections. I don't know how much, um, what's the word, how much you've played with them or looked through them or anything, but your leader fields really are what create your record from the ground up. These, these are your foundation for the record. This is what tells you if it's a book, if it's an audio book, if it's a CD, if it's a map, if it's a kit, things like that. These are the fields that you're going to look at and you're going to fill out. 
And I just want to say, before we go look at it, saying that it's unspecified is not, again, is not a retreat. It's just a, I don't know enough at this point, so I'm not going to guess. And we would prefer that. Um, saying it's unspecified is not quitting. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's just making sure that you're giving the best information that you have. And that's the goal, okay? Um, again, we want at least five controlled vocabulary terms from the LC subject headings list. Um, and we're going to kind of go, I'm going to touch slightly on author authority, which are basically your um, names. And again, duplicate, duplicate, duplicate. I will go over why duplication is really nice. And we're going to check our 800 fields. So first, we're going to take a look at our leader fields. So I'm going to scroll up. So this is our leader field. When you click on this tag editor here, and if you have a new record, this will be blank. It will have some pre-filled stuff, obviously, but this tells you about the record. This is a, a revised record. Someone has gone in and corrected this. Um, it tells you that it's a language material. This is where you can do um, where your kit, things like that. A monograph is usually a book about one subject. Um, and your encoding level for most of you is going to be um, less than full or full. And you can even put minimal. If you're not doing the ISBD punctuation, I would do minimal. Okay. ISBD punctuation, we'll get to that. I have a, a section on it, so we'll come back to it because I have a page for you to look at that's really helpful, okay? <laughs> but this is the leader field that you want to fill out. When you're filling out this record, you want to start at the top and work your way down. So for a book, you have your triple zeros, and then you have your 005, which sounds like it should be the bond, uh, a, a bond a, agent. Bond agent. I was going to say <laughs> villain too. Yeah. This basically fills out your date and time of when you started working on the record. 007, hey, there we is, go. <laughs> uh, yeah, is for CDs uh, or CDs, DVDs, your visual. Uh, audiovisual? Or that just one, visual? that word, audiovisual. Um, and your 008 are for your text items. Okay. Then, of course, you have your 020 which you'll be using for your books and your audiobooks because they will have, if they have anything that says an ISBN next to it, you're going to put that in there, okay? And then for your DVDs and Blu-rays, you will use 024. And if you notice, the 2 is above the A. Try to make sure that your A is up there. And that does that automatically. I don't know why. Um, but just make sure that you're putting it in the right field, okay? And again, you can repeat these. It's really nice if you have a couple of numbers. Um, you can also put what number is on the spine of your DVD case or what number may be on the DVD itself in these areas. So we are going to go over authorities. So this is basically on that graph I had up earlier, I did have the name of someone. This is an authority record um, saying that this one person created this book and they may have multiple names. And so what they do is they put all those names under one name and then they put in the dates associated with that name. Um, so they were born in 1984, they have not died yet. Um, so that has not been updated. So this is a controlled authority and you can find that on your Library of Congress um, authority tab, which I have in the handouts as well. So last but not least, we're going to go to the ISBD punctuation. This is more computer stuff. This is stuff that we need to add in so that it gets displayed properly on different systems um, or the, our record information gets displayed properly. Okay. What it used to be, um, 
older guy lines versus what we use now. So these are the slashes at the end of your title. Um, these are the colons or um, semicolons or apostrophe, uh, sometimes apostrophes, um, but mainly commas um, when you're doing different fields. And this is a really good um, show of what to do for the fields that they usually show up in, okay? Again, with RDA, everything's written out, except for centimeters. I don't know, I think that's because it's an international um, standard already. So I, again, I don't have text on that, but that's what my, my humble opinion um, and thought process says that that's the reason why. Okay. And notice that they have the illustrator. I'm so proud of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this also goes into when to use an equal sign for when you have maybe bilingual item or uh, yeah, link, uh, items, bilingual items. Thank you. Hey, words are hard sometimes. Um, but yeah, this, this just helps different systems communicate with each other and display the record properly. Again, it's a computer thing. It's not really meant for humans. We don't read it. It doesn't make sense grammatically. It doesn't make sense visually. It's for the computer. And again, we're pandering to the computer because they do a lot of work and we love them for that. They make life a little bit easier. Um, you can, if you are advanced and not wanting to use punctuation, opt out of it again. In that leader field, you will just put punct ISBD punctuation omitted and it tells the record um, the, or it tells any system that's using it that it doesn't have that, so it'll just display it as is, okay? Now we are going to go back to my Prezi, which this is the infographic, the, the thing that I use to make my infographic. The good, the bad, and the ugly. So these are some examples of good, bad, and ugly records. How am I on time? You have Again. eight minutes. Okay, but we're at the end, so this is good. <laughs> so I'm going to switch, stop share, and I'm going to share my a Microsoft Word. There we go. Okay, so can you again, make this a little bigger, please? I certainly can. Again, maybe. If it lets me, that's too much. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> pretty close oh, your eyes. There we go. That's yeah. Maybe is that good? Yeah, that's good. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move my little box of people. Okay, again, the reasons why we have standards are to make our records interoperable with different systems, including and not limited to the World Wide Web, Google. Um, other cataloging systems if we ever forbid forbid move to another system or I don't want to even think about what that process would be like <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like no <laughs> um, if we had to do that our records would travel very easily if they look like this <laughs> okay this is this is one of the good reasons we we're thinking for the future we don't want to be there for it but if they have to do it in the future it will be okay um, we're thinking of future generations that's what we're doing so this is a very good record it has all of our rda information it has the title they're using proper isbd punctuation has really good publisher information, um, copyright date. It even says it's a first edition. Also note, if it says first edition on the record, it should say first edition in your book. If it does not, that is not the right record for you. I apologize if everything is similar, but you might have to find something else. Um, again, it has our two ISBNs. If you're bringing in a record and if it has 20 ISBNs, I will say this again, please delete the extra ISBNs. <laughs> it doesn't always, they, they will put audiobooks, they will put eBooks, everything else, all the different formats under one record because they want to save space, which is good, but that is not good for when we are requesting items on Share It, okay? And we need to make sure the right item goes on the right record. Okay, so this is the bad. I'm gonna scroll. So, can you guys kind of see why it's a bad record? We are missing some information. 
some people take the whole what you see is what you get to like the extreme and they will capitalize everything but that's really hard on the eyes this is my personal opinion okay if you want to capitalize it go ahead i will probably change it just warning you <laughs> um i it it's hard on the eyes it really is um there's and no with, page number. there's no page number um, it's missing some RDA information. It has a really good subject list. So this is a record that we would probably call a fixer upper. Okay, just go in and edit those fields. Oh, so the ugly. I'm good. Can can you tell why? <laughs> <laughs> there, there, I hope you can tell why. There. There's, there's nothing, nothing. there. <laughs> it, it tells you the publisher. That's a really good start. And it tells the ISBN, but there's no page number. There's no subject headings it's there's just nothing there and so at that point you're like eh, maybe I should pull in a new record or send this to the um, questionable records report for Liz to look at on a rainy day um, this is one of those red flags please 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 do not attach your items to these kind of records okay thank you I'm thanking you in advance <laughs> okay I'm gonna switch back to Prezi I have little no indicators so I can <laughs> <laughs> find myself among all these pages. I think you'll okay. want to stop share. Stop share. Yeah. I've been moving, I've been doing so good moving between them because <laughs> they're all on one screen, but not this one. Okay, share screen, Prezi. There we go. Okay. Now, again, don't attach your records to the items, but there is a but. <laughs> Fast ad ILL records are an ex exception. Um, your fast ad records will be added via fast ad. And to show, I'm, I'm gonna take a leap into Kathy's territory. I got her approval first, don't worry. <laughs> um, this is how you will add, do a fast ad. Let's switch over. You see this wonderful share it button up here that I already pulled the list down. Maybe. There we go. It was clicked on something else. I think. Clicked on something else. You're going to hit add temporary record. This is where you're going to go to add your temporary records. Okay. It's a very, very small amount of information. It's much different than original cataloging. This is the only time where it's okay to use a record with a very little information. Okay. Um, also, what's really cool about using it this way and adding items this way is that it will prompt you, it will have a little box when you check the item in to delete this record. Okay. And the reason, and the reason we're, this is allowable here is because you are borrowing this book from a library outside mm -hmm. of Pathfinder. It's already cataloged for that library. You just need it for the week, two weeks, three weeks that your patron's using it, and then it's going away again. So it doesn't make sense, of course, to do the full cataloging. You just need a record that you can check in and out to your library, to your patron, so that you you know what they have checked out so you can track it that way so that's why we keep it simple yep and it's again very simple <laughs> it works well um do not delete the share it leave that in there don't delete anything just add things okay and then one more thing catalog cleanup and you <laughs> <laughs> okay we all all are pitching in because i don't know if you know, but we have over 700,000 record numbers in Koha. And there's not that many, well, there, there may be more items than that because you put multiple items per record, but uh, not all of those records are active because they leave a footprint and you get it assigned a new record number, but when you delete them. But we wanna keep Koha running fast. And we want to not have that slow down or shut down at any point because I think we've all been there when Koha wasn't working and we were just like, oh, how do we check out? Um, <laughs> but that's for another, uh, <laughs> that's for another day. So Michael was kind enough to put up a list of catalog cleanup reports. These are wonderful. They have an explanation with them. Um, he, they're really self-explanatory. If you do have questions, let Michael know. Um, heck, most of most of the people here at CK List can tell you. Um, I might stumble a little bit because, again, I'm a cataloger. I I, I usually stay in my corner. Um, but 
nope, this is this is just a wonderful list that you can go off of. Uh, again, running reports using these cleanups and these you can select your libraries for most of these and it's just little tasks that you can do occasionally you don't have to do it all the time be nice but it's not something that you have to do all the time it's just one of those oh i should probably look at that and take care of it okay i think last but not least does anyone have any questions It was a lot of information, you guys. Excellent job, Liz. Lie. Thank you. Yes, that's a lot of information. I gave the wrong link for the um, oh no the cleanup reports because it didn't work because oh, that's no. just life. So here I'm putting in the link chat the actual catalog cleanup reports. I think, <laughs> but it is linked in the handout link um, folder. Mm -hmm. So and all that. all of the places I showed you today they're in that helpful links. Okay. If you, um, do we have, do, are, are any, is anyone interested in looking at the OCLC side of how I catalog? Oh, come on, Liz. It's not Halloween. Don't scare them yet. <laughs> oh, come on. It's super, super fun. This is what I stare at most of the day. I voluntarily look at uh, the same page in every book every day. Okay. This is my brain. <laughs> I find this enjoyable. <laughs> so what I do is I'll do an ISDN search again. If I can't find it, I'll do a title author search. This is what I play with every day. And when I'm making a record, all of these are blank. I have some preset fields, um, but I will go in and I will put in the 650 and I will put in these um, limiter numbers because these are actual code as well. Um, that tell you how to display things or what they're for. Um, but this is what I play with every day. And I find it fun. Some days it's a little annoying because like if there's not a record for an item and it's like really big, <laughs> like a, DVDs take forever. Okay, I'm just telling you now. DVDs and movies, they take forever. They're upwards of an hour to full catalog one of those originally. I'm just going to stop share. Um, you have a comment that says, uh, Connie from Agra says, my head is spinning and I want to say thanks so, so much to you for being able to do all of this for us when we feel overwhelmed. Connie, this is, yeah, the, exactly the point. And when we encourage you to uh, go ahead and let CKLS do the cataloging for you, I think now you can see all the, all the work that Liz puts into it to get that excellent record that we need for, for our catalog and also to share out with others. You'll see on the... Um, Z39 record that we pull in from other libraries. Other libraries also pull in from us when they do copy cataloging. They're connected to our catalog and they look at our records as well. All of the systems are try to connect to us because we have exceptional records. Um, we just do a really good job. We care not just now about what the records look like for now, but especially what it looks like for in the future. And that's why you pull in those RDA elements because if we either do have to convert to a different catalog system other than Pathfinder, we have to pay for each record to look good. And this is already saving us money. And I also wanted to say that other systems don't all have a cataloger like Liz. Um, across the state of Kansas, there are only just a few systems that, that have that. And all those other small librarians are out on their own. I'm and very thankful we have a Liz. I am too. And if um, we can take this burden off your shoulders with your limited time that you have at the library, that means that you can spend that time doing other great things for your library. And so we're very happy. Well, I'm very happy to have Liz <laughs> take that burden off your shoulders. I have helped sometimes, but Liz has had to tell me that I wasn't as detail oriented as I needed to be. I never knew what the leader was um, before the 001s, the 00s, whatever. Um, before she taught me last fall, because I was like, I don't know what that is. I'm skipping it. <laughs> I have been buying a few books lately that are self-published or maybe out of country. That would be impossible for me to figure out. So, so much. Thank you so much for your understanding, Liz. <laughs> Those, and they're, it's enjoyable. It, it is a lot like detective work. I, I'm a very big fan of Batman, who is a different kind of detective, but uh, 
you know what? I condone a cape occasionally and pretend. And Batgirl, she was a, a librarian. Yes, mm-hmm. this is true. This is true. Okay. But again, yeah, this is just this is just to give you um, good information and good resources for when you're going out on your own. Again, if you want me to come and train you cataloging, let me know. And uh, Liz's cheat sheets that are in those um, that handouts folder, very, very helpful when you're, um, even when you're just editing a record that you brought in, very helpful to know what to look at and what to, what to fix as well. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording.